Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution. And for the benefit of our superb guest, who is returning to the National Constitution Center after having been one of its founders and having played an instrumental role in building the support for this place, I want each of you, because I see some familiar faces in the audience, to recite with me the, <laughs> the inspiring mandate from Congress of the National Constitution Center, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Very well done. Good job. Well, Judith Roden is indeed responsible, uh, among other people, one of the principal people responsible for having convinced Congress to give us that inspiring charter, for having uh, got the support necessary for the creation of this spectacular institution, this national treasure. And we are so honored to welcome her back to her home at the National Constitution Center. Let me give a quick plug for our upcoming programs, which include James McPherson on why the Civil War matters on March 16th. Uh, we have a wonderful program on uh, the anniversary of the 19th Amendment, March 4th, on the Supreme Court and second wave feminism. And on March 25th, we launch our national series of town hall programs with the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society at the National Press Club in Washington. And it's going to be a spectacular event. Um, let me introduce Judith Roden and then have a conversation about this superb, um, thought-provoking, and deep book, The Resilience Dividend. She is president of the Rockefeller Foundation, previously president of the University of Pennsylvania, provost of Yale University, and really did more to build Penn into the spectacular world-class institution than it is today, uh, than is uh, a a imaginable. She has recalibrated the focus of the Rockefeller Foundation to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Today, the foundation supports innovations to expand opportunity and to build greater resilience. And one of the exciting things about reading this book, it's the work of a scholar, a practitioner, and a philanthropist. And she's able to describe how the Rockefeller Foundation has actually funded the research and the programs that she describes. She is a member of many, many boards uh, and um, she is the author of more than 200 academic articles, has co-written or written 14 books, including The Power of Impact Investing. And um, after this conversation, after the show, she will such sign books, and we will hope you'll join us for a reception upstairs. So um, we'll much look forward to that. Judith Roden, welcome to the National Constitution Center. <laughs> There's so many, it's the stories in this book, of course, that stick in the mind because they're so vivid. And I just want to begin because it stuck in mind. Tell us about the escalators in Medellin. Let me say first, Jeffrey, it's, it is wonderful to be here and it's always great to come back home, both to the Constitution Center, which meant so much to me as we were struggling um, to help get it started and seeing how amazing it's, it's become and your vision for taking it forward in the future, it's really very heartening. And it's always great to be home in Philadelphia. So thank you for being here. It's a snowy day and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, the story that Jeffrey's uh, referring to is the story of Medellin, Colombia. And it's a quite extraordinary story. Uh, Medellin was well known as the drug capital of the world, it was truly. Uh, one of the most unsafe cities anywhere because it was the center of drug trafficking as it was coming to the United States. And the government tried all of the traditional mechanisms for uh, suppressing the drug trade, policing, military force, and the like. And uh, it just kept flourishing and it was quite unsuccessful. And citizens and business leaders, community leaders and, and planners and experts got together and said, we need an entirely new approach. And they stepped back and really began to understand that literally and figuratively, the problem may have been, among other things, the geography of Medellin. So it's a flat valley floor um, where all of the economic activity was and all the prosperous people lived. And then going up into the hills on either side, 
um, were the slums, and the higher it got, the poorer the people were, and the more vulnerable they were, both to the drug trade and also to other kinds of criminal behaviors. And so they built a transportation system that uh, had a metro along the floor, and then gondolas such as we see in ski resorts going up to the hills, and where they couldn't reach the people by gondola, they actually built carved escalators into the hills going up to the most disconnected communities. And at every stop, they put health centers and daycare centers, clinics, information, and activities. And so you could start to see the transformation very quickly. Uh, wall art in the stations evolved. People painted their roofs. They really connected to the people on the, on the floor. And this wasn't about building a transportation system. This was connecting the most disaffected communities to hope and to potential prosperity. In 10 years, crime is down 90% in Medellin. It now is a hugely popular tourist de destination. It has made itself resilient by transforming its community, diversifying its economy, um, and is now more resilient to other crises or uh, disruptions that emerge. They had a terribly serious mudslide which they confronted in a very, very resilient way, rebounding very quickly and very effectively. So the idea about Medellin is that if you build one of the elements of building resilience is building capacity, in this case, social capacity, but also physical infrastructure capacity. The idea of the dividend, Jeffrey, that I talk about over and over again in the book is that if you do it thoughtfully, if you do this intentionally, you get more bangs for the buck. So you don't have to just make one investment to get one impact. And in these days when cities, communities, nations are really strapped financially, it's important to be able to demonstrate that this pays off in the good times. It pays off in multiple ways, and it's protective in the bad times. It you emphasize with Medellin how important social cohesion is as an element of resilience. And another example of social cohesion uh, came in the aftermath of the bombing of the Boston Marathon. That is one of your great, it was a tragedy, but Boston responded impressively. You talk about how it was possible to uh, build on planning. And then you give this great example from social psychology of the tend and befriend response, which is different than fight or flight, about these two women who helped each other tell that story, what it says about social cohesion, and how that fit into the response to Boston more broadly. Well, in, in both the Medellin example and in the part of Boston, uh, the, the post-marathon situation that you describe, we're talking about how people respond to a crisis. And when a crisis occurs, if you think about it, often the first responder isn't the policeman or the firemen, because they may not be able to get to you quickly enough. So often the first responder is literally the person next door or the person <laughs> standing or sitting next to you, as was the case in the Boston Marathon bombing. And so those uh, communities, those cities, those places that have more trust, have more social cohesion, are, are um, communities that do better in times of crisis. We saw. Uh, in New York, in the recovery from Sandy, that communities that were equally hard hit recovered differentially depending on how, com how those communities uh, were before Sandy hit, how, how cohesive they were, how much trust there, there was. We saw this in the Chicago heat waves. The differential pattern of people who died in the heat wave was surprisingly um, linked to the differences in community cohesion once you controlled for socioeconomic. But if I can go back, Jeffrey, to Boston, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to make an important point about resilience. And that is, and I see my good friend Howard Kunruther, and of course the Wharton Risk Management Center is um, uh, leading the way on this. But the beginning part of resilience is really readiness, and part of that readiness is awareness, assessing the risks, understanding your vulnerabilities, um, and then preparing. 
not for any single crisis, but making yourself more aware and more adaptive for every kind of crisis that may hit. So Boston, for about six years, had actually been integrating their government responders with their business responders, with healthcare responders, with communications and technology experts in the city. And so they had a completely um, integrated plan for what would happen if something, if an emergency befell them, whether it was a hurricane or a nor'easter, what they were sort of thinking about was a snowstorm like they have, series of snowstorms like they have now, or a terrorist attack. But they didn't know what would actually befall them. They used events, public events, to practice, although the public didn't know that. So a Fourth of July parade or a sports team wins a pennant. And they actually rehearsed um, all of their responses so that when the marathon bombing occurred, nobody had to guess who was on first. They had already rehearsed that Governor Patrick would be the communicator in chief. They had already rehearsed that the FBI would be the lead agency, no matter what it was that had occurred. And so everybody knew what they were supposed to do, including, luckily, the medical first responders who were there. Um, no one who got to a hospital died um, in that marathon bombing, which is very unusual when there's something that awful and horrific that occurs. And, and part of it is attributable to their readiness um, before the fact. And then after the fact, uh, some of the social cohesion kicked in. And I, I just like that story of Rebecca and Jenny so much because, because of this uh, tend and befriend syndrome, these two women helped each other and tell what happened next. Well, the two women helped each other. They were very good friends. One friend was worried about the other because she was pregnant. And so she reached out and really tried to take care of her, not thinking about herself um, in this moment of really reaching out. It wasn't until a few hours later, um, after she had taken care of her friend, that she began to feel terrible herself. Her friends looked at her, and she had gotten hit by a terrible piece of shrapnel. They got her to a hospital. and. But she did well during the immediate aftermath because she was mobilized to help someone else. And so um, we see these kinds of stories. And you know, often the kind of work we do and the kind of work that resilience is typically seen to be about is about building infrastructure, whether it's seawalls or levees or um, bridges that do certain kinds of things in, in storms. But the social infrastructure, um, which is one of the points of the book, is critically important as well, not as an alternative, um, but in addition. I just jumped right in because I love the stories of Medellin and Boston so much, but let's go back to the beginning and define resilience, which you call the, capital, the capacity of any entity to prepare for disruptions, to recover from shocks and stresses, and to adapt and grow from a disruptive experience. And then you say that there are at least three trends that have created more of these disruptive experiences in the 21st century, including uh, urbanization, climate change, and global globalization. I want to ask about climate change. And I'm going to ask the obvious question. How are we doing dealing with snow? You know, it was snowing today. And I, I, you were coming from Miami. I came from Colorado. And, and the airports are all closed, and New York, during the last storm that didn't materialize, overreacted and shut down. Is there a danger in the effort to implement a precautionary principle of overreacting and trying to uh, predict too much? <laughs> um, I would rather be overprepared than underprepared. Um, the goal really is to manage what is avoidable and then avoid the unmanageable. And if you think about it in that framework, over-preparation is a, is a very, very good thing. Um, and so we can always, as Monday morning quarterbacks, sit back and say, should they have closed the subway? Should they have done this? Should they have done that? But it could have been far worse. And, and, and certainly, Boston has just been uh, hit over and over again in the last few weeks. Um, but all cities, if, if we take as our starting premise here that it, crisis is the new normal, that the risks are escalating, and they are escalating at a very, very accelerated pace. 
So there isn't a week that goes by somewhere in the world that we don't see something, a violent storm or a flood, uh, a cyber attack, a terrorist attack, an economic blow. Just think about it. And so those are the shocks. And then there are also the slower burning stresses, air quality, congestion, crime. And they reduce a capacity to, excuse me, to respond to the shocks when they do occur. So these are accelerating because of those three trends. Um, three quarters of the pop, we're already at half the population of the world living in cities. It'll be three quarters very quickly. Um, and three quarters of people packed into dense urban spaces where the ripple effects are enormous um, if something bad does happen. Uh, makes urbanization a serious and um, compelling trend to observe. And, and I talk about the colliding of those three. So climate change is making so many areas more vulnerable, obviously rural as well as urban, but the impact on the urban areas is great. And because of the way most world cities are located, most of them are on water. Um, so rivers, coastlines, and their vulnerability is disproportionately growing because of where they're geographically located. And then globalization, of course. So it used to be that if a crisis occurred, it was contained in one place. But now, you know, pandemics spread around the world on airplanes. The Bangkok floods in 2011 took down a third of the global supply chain and technology all over the world. So it's the fact of these three forces that make these disruptions occur. I'm trying to argue in this book that not every disruption has to become a disaster, and that building resilience and building resiliently is a very critical mitigating factor, and that it pays extensive dividends in the good times as well as in times of, of emergency or crisis. Tell us about some of the responses to these extreme weather events. Uh, Superstorm S Sandy is an important uh, example for you, both because different parts of New York reacted with varying degrees of success, and then you were part of an important commission afterward to make recommendations about how to behave better the next time. So what can Sandy tell us? Um, I, I co-chaired Governor Cuomo's Sandy Recovery Commission, and we had the opportunity to really persuade the state and then ultimately the federal government as well in the Federal Recovery Task Force to build back resiliently. Often our tendency is to want to put everything back to normal. We just want it all to be the same after something bad happens. And often the same is what caused the vulnerabilities in the first place. So we've got to really transform that tendency. And by the way, the federal recovery often ensures that things go back the, the same way rather than um, uh, being changed in some way for the better. So we worked uh, on our commission to try to get New York to really focus on building back more resiliently. So it, it wouldn't have been necessary. It, it, it might have been um, prevented that half of Lower Manhattan was taken down when one generating station in Con Ed went down. So we have this wonderful opportunity now because you can build with smart grid technology that enables you to use renewable energy or any source of energy that's both most available and uh, priced in a most effective way. So that benefit gets passed to the consumer quite quickly. But if you put smart switches into the smart grid technology, it allows you to actually uh, de-network, to island that piece which fails immediately so that it doesn't take everything else down. So a, re a resilience building characteristic is fail safely rather than failing catastrophically. You can't prevent, always prevent failure, but you can absolutely always prevent failing catastrophically. So that is a critical piece of, of building resilience. The uh, other component of this is that we really tried to be smart about how we were rebuilding and what we were incenting um, in the greater New York 
uh, New Jersey area as, um, as, as the recovery occurred. So uh, we ran a competition, a national competition with HUD, Housing and Urban Development, for a billion dollars uh, worth of the recovery money. And we had global design teams compete uh, for pieces of this billion dollars. And the criterion was that they had to work with the local communities so that the communities actually worked with the experts and played an important role in defining what they needed as the recovery was unfolding. Often the experts come in, they define what should be done, and the communities don't have a say. And if you want to build social resilience and you want to build community capacity at the same time that you're restoring infrastructure, you need a different kind of process, not just a different kind of infrastructure. So this competition enabled that. And I'll just tell you about uh, two of the six winners, because I think you'll see immediately why the resilience dividend became so important. So there will be um, a significant chunk of that money that will go to the restoration of the Meadowlands. And the restoration will be done in a way that really accepts the notion that we have to start being able to live with water. We can't any longer pave and pipe and pump water out. Um, and so how do we take these natural lands, marshlands, and restore wetlands? And the Meadowlands restoration will have new transportation routes, new kinds of marshlands and waterways that allow water to come in, but only so far, um, but in a very constructive way that will create parks and recreation space at the same time. So three wins for one investment. That's the resilience dividend. Staten Island is going to rebuild, but instead of seawalls, they're going to have living breakwaters restoring the ecology of the ocean at the tip of Staten Island that used to be a tremendously successful oyster habitat in the last century. So they're going to restore that habitat. They've already developed, and you'll love this, this marvelous curriculum for local students who are working on the oyster bed restoration. So the community immediately gets engaged in a new process. Um, several of the homes will not go back where they were because they're just going to be washed away over and over again. So there's a, a sort of community redesign piece of this. So again, that's the resilience dividend. Same investment, same amount of money, but multiple wins, multiple outcomes for that single investment for the good times. The bad times then will have better protection as well. I have to ask how many of your post-Sandy recommendations were implemented, and this is partly for personal reasons. My parents live on the Upper East Side right along the East River, and during Sandy, the river overflowed and flooded their garage as well as several other buildings along there. First of all, should they move? And, and is, uh, are the embattled uh, residents of the uh, Upper East Side, the, the, the deprived denizens of uh, that neighborhood, uh, going to be protected the next time a superstorm happens. Um, so a third winner is a project called the Big U, which at least will start with a complete protection from West 57th up to East 34th Street. So all of Lower Manhattan that's even more vulnerable. But what about um, Upper Manhattan? Then, not yet, not yet. <laughs> um, and again, instead of ugly seawalls, which is what was originally proposed, um, this design has tremendously innovative community-based activities that were built in as part of the design. So walls that drop down that could be floodgates, but they open in really interesting ways to create markets, um, new transportation spaces, bike paths. Uh, we're seeing a lot of that. And then we can take it up further, but uh, we pick the most vulnerable places. But I would say New York has a very different mindset now. But remember that the next thing that hits New York or anywhere will probably not be a flood. Um, this last year was the hottest year on record um, since recording began. There are many who believe that what will hit the Northeast next, as well as other parts of the United States, and we've seen this already in Europe, will be massive heat waves. Mm. So again, our argument and my argument in this book is we don't become resilient by looking in the rearview mirror. 
One of the things we saw on the Sandy Recovery Commission was that after 9-11, a lot of the businesses and, and, and uh, real estate developers put their generators in the basement because after all, the next bad thing was gonna happen, you were gonna mm -hmm. get hit from the air again. And of course, they all flooded during Sandy. So it isn't, it's really to argue that you can't predict every risk mm. and therefore you've gotta build a very differentiated and redundant capacity. Redundancy is one of the key features. It's another of the key characteristics of building resilience. And one of the things we've seen is very non-redundant, very brittle systems in businesses, in cities. You know, we, we were at that point in, in American, well, global business, actually, where the mantra of the day was, you don't keep extra inventory, it's real-time manufacturing, lean management, and all of that lack of redundancy made many, many businesses actually quite vulnerable, and the Bangkok supply, uh, affecting the supply chains is one example. Mm -hmm. A favorite example I give in the book um, is the example of the uh, yoga company, yoga mm. pants company, Lululemon. Um, some of you will remember that in 2011, um, they had a huge crisis because their yoga workout pants were found to be way too sheer. And they lost within a very short period of time about a third of their market cap and many shareholder lawsuits. And the challenge for them was that they only had one source of supply of the fiber, one manufacturing site, you know, one um, uh, factory actually, and so they couldn't recover. So it's a classic example of thinking about why some redundancy in a system is really critical to build resilience. Um, it's an important uh, complexity of the argument because you note that people tend to extrapolate and imagine that the next disaster will look like the last one, but they're bad at that because of what you call the availability heuristic. People exaggerate the chances that they'll be victimized by a terrorist attack because they see pictures of terrorist attacks, but they don't think about car accidents. Is this a political challenge as you were trying to get uh, organizations and cities to think in a complex, resilient fashion? You know, it's been quite interesting, Jeffrey. We, Rockefeller has an initiative that we launched uh, on uh, the occasion of our centennial two years ago called 100 Resilient Cities, and it's a challenge where we invited global cities uh, around the world to participate. Interestingly, we've had 800 cities apply from all six continents, 17 mm. languages. The applications have been in, which, which startled us. So it's, it's absolutely striking a chord. And we've picked the first 70, and we'll pick the last cohort this year or, or, or early in 2016. And we've been struck by the fact that although individuals may miscalculate because of the availability heuristic, that they overinterpret the likelihood that something will occur to them if it's an extremely salient event. Um, as you said, a terrorist attack or um, the, the example that first led the scholars to investigate this notion was after Betty Ford announced that she had breast cancer and they studied how many women got uh, mammograms in the next week. Now, that's a good thing, but it was way out of proportion to the number of women who would have breast cancer. So they started getting interested in how these salient events can actually make people misrepresent. In the 100 Resilient Cities applications, um, we're actually seeing underestimation of the serious risks in ways that are very interesting. So when we took the 800, um, that uh, have applied so far. And um, in this year's uh, risk report uh, for the World Economic Forum uh, reported at Davos, the highest risk in terms of potential impact for the first time was water. Too much of it, too little of it, conflict over it. Um, and so we looked at our 800 cities to see what they wrote about water and risk and 60% of them said that they were vulnerable in some way. 
we overlaid that with Google Maps and with historical documents on water conflicts around those cities or in those cities. And they underestimated it's actually 85% of them are vulnerable in some way. So we tend to believe, I don't know, Howard, what you think of this, that people actually underestimate risk, or they mis misestimate. They overestimate salient, emergency kinds of things, but they underestimate um, uh, a variety of risks that really will make them vulnerable. Are we doing uh, better or worse uh, when you take this historical view? You have some amazing accounts here of the response to the San Francisco earthquake of 06, where the army made it worse by actually intentionally blowing things up to stop fires and increase the fires, and the Halifax explosion of the boat with all the TNT, which just sounded completely just appalling, although they did learn from that. Are, are we doing better nowadays than they did in the old days, and why or why not? Um, well, we're certainly doing better because we do learn from our mistakes, but the world is also changing. So not all of that learning is effective and generalizable to the new 21st century challenges. And that's why we don't want people to stop benefiting from learning, but we want them to start believing that learning from the last example may not be sufficient in being ready for whatever hits next. You know, we were recently in Paris um, and talking to, and it's one of our new cities in the 100 Resilient Cities group, and talking to the mayor's deputies. And so here, you know, when they applied in November, they didn't write about terrorism. Mm. And now, of course, it's on everyone's mind. And if you think about terrorism, it's also about immigration, it's about exclusion, it's about conflict and lack of social cohesion. So the root causes that make you want to focus on those elements of resilience may be the very critical things that they'll need to work on. That's fascinating. So if you were advising Paris about how to uh, be resilient about future attacks, what sort of factors should they be thinking about? Well, we will be advising yeah. Paris. And another um, uh, city that we selected in this second cohort is uh, St. Louis, who wrote unbelievably beautifully and articulately about what happened in Ferguson. Mm. And the fact that they're going to need to really understand and deeply impact at a very root cause level. So we're beginning that work in both of these cities. Our goal, and, and this is so important in this work, is to help the cities evolve to their own solutions. We come in with a standard framework for them to have these conversations. And, and no, one, no city gets selected unless the application included city officials, uh, or virtually no city, um, uh, business leaders, community leaders, civil society, because these have to come from the bottom up as well as from the top down to really develop resilient solutions. These two examples you've given, terrorism in Paris and race in, in Ferguson, are of course of central interest to the Constitution Center. Uh, and as I hear you, you're saying that you're not advising these cities to focus merely on the criminal law enforcement aspects, but to look much more broadly. Should that be generalized when we think about Absolutely. issues involving race, crime, and terrorism? You started with Medellin. Yeah. So they, try, they focused on the drug deaths and the drug traffic, but that was only the symptom. It wasn't until they got to the root causes that they were really able to virtually eradicate the symptoms. So what makes this work so interesting is that it is a diversity of shocks and stresses. Yes, flooding is very high on a lot of cities' lists and drought on others, so water-related things, uh, aging infrastructure uh, and the like. But more and more, particularly in the second cohort of applications, we are seeing these social issues. London wrote about um, cybersecurity. Hmm. It's deeply concerned about cyber issues. The benefit that the cities get, and, and I just want to say this so that 
uh, the audience really understands why we're so excited about this <laughs> particular piece of work, which is the evolution of the thinking in the book and all of the examples to now what we can actually do globally. I mean, the wonderful thing about heading a foundation is that you can see problems and you actually can try to fix them. And so that's what the 100 <laughs> Resilient Cities is really all about. Um, and each of the cities gets a chief resilience officer, which we pay for, which is an innovation, a person who reports to the mayor whose goal and role it is both to integrate across the silos of government, which you know the Constitution never envisioned that government would become so siloed, maybe from federal to state, but not within a particular level of government, and yet it, it has. So to do that integration, but also to integrate across a variety of sectors. The cities then get help developing from the ground up and with leadership from the top down, um, a resilient strategy. And then we've assembled a platform of goods and services that they will have access to depending on what their strategy is. So Palantir, the big data analytics company, will be doing a front end risk um, monitoring based on aggregating all of their data. Microsoft has donated its cybersecurity um, constructs. Swiss Re has its CatNet ri risk um, metrics and is actually going to develop a municipal catastrophe bond for those cities. The Nature Conservancy, all of this is pro bono, the Nature Conservancy is doing all of the soft natural infrastructure consulting. And so we have, um, and then we have a variety of really interesting experts on social root causes, immigration experts. Um, we keep getting more and more entities that want to be part of this platform because they really want to work on the solutions. A third element of resilience, a third characteristic, is integration. So we have the capacity to help these cities integrate across all of these elements of their vulnerability after they've also assessed all of the elements of their assets. So it's, it's a completely integrated plan that they will ultimately be able to implement, not just develop. A few more questions on Paris because it's my favorite city and they're also experiencing terrible trouble right now. Um, there was a just a haunting video on the internet now of a, 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 I think it was a rabbi who walked around Paris with a yarmulke and filmed it and he was just subject to the most terrible anti-Semitic taunting uh, in ways that uh, made one fear for the future of Jews in Paris. Can the resilience approach by looking at root causes actually solve a problem as deeply entrenched as that? I don't know. Um, I think Paris is uh, too raw, too new to really know. So let me turn to an example where we now see the outcome. Many of you re will remember um, the Oslo shootings where the shooter first uh, downtown um, killed a number of people and then went horrifically to that island of Utoya and killed so many children. Um, his rhetoric was incredibly anti-Muslim, anti-immigration. And if you look at the way the then Prime Minister, Jan Stoltenberg of, of Norway, helped the country heal, it would have been so easy to fall back on the anti-Muslim, anti-immigration rhetoric. And his speeches, his galvanizing of his, of his citizens around, you know, we're Norwegians, we can't let him define who we are and what we'll do. We need to build more inclusive, more open, more welcoming society. We need to redefine what Norway is and feels like. They are a very different society. Now, clearly, they're quite homogeneous, but that could have been problematic in developing a response like that. So we're not advising Paris in what to do. That would be hubris. But we're giving them examples from a variety of places about how to begin to think about it. The Prime Minister of, of Denmark, whom we know um, well, I mean, she's going to be in the same situation now. So 
uh, unfortunately, we really are seeing many places, and, and this, I, I think this is a new moment where both anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim forces mm. are rising together in this unbelievable dialectic that is explosive. And I don't have the answer, but I think it will be critical that we develop the mechanisms to help each place and each individual, frankly, um, develop an answer. Leadership is important, as you say. It's, you give the example of Governor Deval Patrick after the Boston bombings and how he insisted, we are one, we are Boston, and that was crucial. Can lessons from uh, responses to environmental crises inform responses to terrorism? You tell about how Sean Donovan, the Secretary of Housing, carries around at home a sponge <laughs> shaped like Nor Norway? Or, yes. No, no, Rotterdam. Rotterdam, because that's because <laughs> they responded well to their previous yes. flooding. Can the Rotterdam reaction to flooding inform the you know, Danish response to terrorism? Absolutely, and, and that, Jeffrey, I think is, is the critical point, that every response and how you both recover and how you revitalize in response to it is a lesson for another place, not because you can replicate the playbook, but you can absolutely replicate the approach. So think about New Orleans. Um, New Orleans after Katrina was, of course, a problem of flooding and the levees breaking, but it was also a complete social and political breakdown. That was a critical part of what was wrong for many, many years before that didn't go wrong. Um, it just was demonstrated and revealed um, in such horribly bold relief um, when New Orleans flooded. By some incompetence and some good luck, New Orleans began its recovery more slowly. It didn't start rebuilding everything right away, um, and therefore, now, this is 2015, so it's 10 years this year, you can really see, looking back at that, that 10 years, that they used the opportunity to revitalize and transform New Orleans. So they took over their school system, much higher level of public education performance now over 10 years. They massively diversified their economy. Um, so they're no longer as reliant on the oil and gas industry. They have young entrepreneurial startups. They were named by Wired magazine as the most innovative city in America, and young people are flocking there. Um, they have a lot of wetland and natural restoration. They rebuilt their public housing, a lot of it, in literally very resilient to flooding. Um, ways uh, using all kinds of new engineering technology that was available and that's important because it was public housing um, so it's attractive it's resilient um, and they thought quite a lot about both what it would look like and where it would be that kind of intentional revitalization is what Paris has the opportunity to do now in terms of the fault lines that this is demonstrating, which didn't happen the day the shooting occurred. And this is how they're thinking about it. Can this be the call for and the moment to really think about revitalization? It's a beautiful place. Mm. You know, it's got, we all know how gorgeous it is. It's got a troubled social infrastructure. I have to ask, how did Paris fix the problem that led to thousands of elderly people dying of heat in the summer of 2003. And to what degree is politics important and how effective the response of a city is going to be to a crisis? Yeah, it's extremely important. I yeah. think actually Chicago did it better. Mm -hmm. Chicago also had a massive heat wave. And um, they created much more planning, much more um, integrated response teams and the like. They a new kind of set of actions spring in 
if the temperature goes over a certain um, uh, set of degrees. I, I don't think Paris's planning is actually as good. Uh, and more Europeans die in heat waves than Americans because I think we see that in a variety of European cities and the cities we'll be working with, will be several of them uh, will be looking at that issue. What are other political challenges to the resilience approach that you suggest? Are there, are there democratic pressures to put resources in the most uh, visible things to protect us against low probability risks and so forth? What, 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 how, how well equipped are, is, are democratic governments to implement these strategies? <laughs> well, it's so interesting. I had um, the privilege of doing a congressional briefing um, before the holidays, and as I said to the members, you know, there aren't Democratic and Republican storms. There aren't Democratic and Republican you know, these communities are getting hit equally and they're getting hit in the same way. So let's put aside our political differences about this. Um, both sides of the aisle believe that we should get more bang for the buck. The resilience dividend is about doing that and creating the kinds of uh, both regulations and legislation that allow us to do that. And we have several that are um, in the way. So the Stafford Act uh, requires virtually that you need to rebuild the same way in order to get federal reimbursement. So Vermont was horribly flooded in 2011. They rebuilt their culverts, not surprisingly, and, and flood runoff at a much higher and better level to have better flooding protection. And they're not getting reimbursed from FEMA because they didn't, reimburse, they didn't rebuild it the same way. Now that is really ridiculous. So this, ha this has to change, and that is within the legislative um, capacity of, of Congress. Um, we know that the federal uh, flood insurance program, although the maps are being redrawn, we have new floodplains, but it's being held up now by a variety of political interests. We don't want to disadvantage poor people. We can do means testing and give vouchers. Um, uh, as our wonderful colleagues at Wharton are, are uh, suggesting and working on. Um, but we're also distorting the private insurance markets by the kind of federal policies we have around flood insurance. So that's another example. There, and and we, governments, our government, most US states and cities, let alone the national government, don't do net present value testing. So they never make their infrastructure decisions based on future risks as part of the analytic equation. And they really are going to have to do that. But maybe I'll end with my favorite and most positive example. Um, one of our cities is Christchurch, New Zealand, um, hit just rocked by two successive uh, earthquakes in 2010 and 11, and then a lot of really bad aftershocks. And so virtually all of the middle part of the city was taken down. Um, and they have to rebuild. And they've decided to make every element of the rebuilding a resilience building process. So they have a very strong view about participatory democracy, which they're modeling after the participatory budgeting process invented in Puerto Alegre, Brazil, which uh, they're very admiring of, and so are we. Um, and so they have teams of citizens working with builders and developers and government officials and experts. And so how and where things are getting rebuilt um, is being decided in this very participatory and democratic way. And they're sort of practicing democracy. So the mayor decided they were getting really good at that, her citizens. So they have to redraw most of their electoral districts because they're redrawing the whole city. So she asked the citizens to decide how they would like their electoral districts redrawn. And they've decided that they want to have every electoral district be as socioeconomically and racially diverse as it possibly can be. In other words, not the United States. <laughs> <laughs> We have time just for two questions, I think, uh, uh, and uh, here they are. What is the role of A, the media, and B, the insurance industry in, in calculating uh, risk and, and making resilience possible? 
Um, the insurance is, industry is a great partner in our work in, in um, several uh, entities that are doing both risk and resilience work. And so we see both the reinsurers who have amazing analytic tools uh, and also the, the primary insurers who now have a huge vested interest in not only understanding risk but in protecting um, assets against risk are among the most forward thinking and, and most creative. Now, I was extremely disheartened to see the piece in the paper today that said in the Sandy recovery that they had found evidence that um, there was fraud by the insurance adjusters who actually um, changed documents to have less payout. That's, I mean, so that will obviously clearly need to be investigated, but at the higher levels, we have found the insurance industry to be extremely, extremely helpful and, and thoughtful in this area. Um, I think the media is extremely problematic um, because everything gets magnified. You know, we have the weather channel suddenly is sort of drama central to any kind of storm and movement and whatever. And um, it over dramatizes and, and over stresses, I think, systems that really could respond effectively. So it makes people more anxious, and I don't think that's a good thing. One of the side benefits of, of Governor Patrick being so effective and communicating so effectively, and by the way, effective communication here is not only saying what you do know, it's telling your citizens what you don't yet know. And that's equally important when things are going wrong, and he was great at it. Um, but the, it was studied afterwards, and it's very clear that as a result of him communicating so effectively and not relying so much on the media to tell the story, he prevented the kinds of rumors that often get spread through digital wildfires and the kinds of, of media stories that start to take on a life of their own. So um, we want the media to be responsive. We want them to tell good and true stories. Um, but in times of crisis, uh, they often are unhelpful initially. Great. Uh, not great, but interesting. Um, <laughs> no. the, the, the last uh, question that, uh, is, uh, is this. Redundancy is expensive and can take many forms. How can we be assured that a particular form of redundancy will be appropriate? Um, let me give you the example of Rotterdam and Hoboken. Um, so here's the way redundancy becomes less expensive. Uh, in Hoboken's case, uh, they needed uh, um, parking garages. They, they have not a lot of parking, um, and they also have a quite, uh, few, quite small number of good green space and, and recreational facilities. So using Dutch engineering and modeled after Rotterdam, they are building parking garages that actually double as uh, water overflow tanks in times of flooding, they're underground, so, and the surface now they're building recreational space and green space. So here's a way to build redundancy by doing three different things for one kind of investment. So redundancy doesn't only mean doing everything the same way twice. It means building in new redundant ways to have multiple capacities often from the same thing. But in some cases, you do need something twice. So in the Sandy recovery, we recommended um, regional stockpiles of critical infrastructure. So you don't know next time if it's going to be Connecticut or New Jersey or New York. Not everyone has to keep all of the same critical infrastructure. So you can build redundancy into a system in a more collaborative, integrated, sharing way. And partnership is a critical part of building resiliently. So there are multiple ways to do that. I, I find expensive being a political excuse for inaction. Because over and over again, the stories this book is telling is how 
A, you get so much benefit in the good times, and B, when you think about expensive, if you look at the global data, for every $4, let's just take development aid, for every $4 spent on development aid, a dollar is eroded in the next crisis. For every, we spent in the US, in between 2011 and 2013, 180 billion dollars responding to national disasters of one sort or another. If you divided that by every household in the United States and just use that money to help each household do something that would make them more resilient, that would add so much more capacity. So it really pays to pay for prevention because relief and recovery is so very much more expensive. Well, this has been a superb conversation. And I have to say, what makes this book so compelling is its optimism in the face of complexity and great challenge. You talk about some very serious uh, threats that society will face because of some structural changes that you describe. And yet, you give concrete examples of how actual societies and cities at a local level on up are able to deal constructively and in a complex way, uh, in a way that uh, can preserve democracy. So thank you so much thank for the you. wonderful work you're doing and supporting it. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to join President Roden upstairs in a reception uh, where we'd love to uh, continue the conversation uh, over wine and cheese. And copies of the book are on sale downstairs. And Judith Roden will sign copies up at the reception. So please join us thank up you. in Bogle. And please thank you so much.